This is episode 94 of the MD Edge Sitecast. I'm MD Edge editor Gina Henderson, filling in for Nick Andrews. This week, Dr. Ruta Nonax conducts a masterclass on treating women with postpartum depression. We caught up with Dr. Nonax at the 2019 Psychopharmacology Update meeting in Cincinnati. We'll be right back with Dr. Nonax after this message. This is Ruta Nonax. Uh, I am a psychiatrist uh, coming to you from the perinatal psychiatry program at Massachusetts General Hospital. And today I will be talking about the treatment of postpartum depression. And I have no uh, relevant disclosures to make. Um, So I will start out by talking about postpartum depression, which affects about 10 to 15% of women after delivery. Although it is thought to mostly occur after delivery, it occurs that for many women, uh, postpartum depression begins towards the tail end of pregnancy and worsens after delivery. Women with postpartum depression typically report uh, depressive symptoms, lack of pleasure in their uh, usual activities, they report having problems bonding with the baby or not really enjoying being with the baby, they feel like they're inadequate mothers. They often have fairly significant sleep disturbance and uh, many times they report that the baby is sleeping just fine but that they can't sleep. They're too uh, revved up, too edgy, too anxious. Um, And in this population we see a lot of comorbid anxiety, typically generalized anxiety symptoms but also some obsessive uh, compulsive symptoms uh, in this population. Many women uh, worry about the safety of their baby. Uh, They worry that something terrible might happen to them and they also can have intrusive thoughts about harmful things coming to the baby which can be very very distressing. Um, So often this heightened level anxiety interferes with their ability to enjoy the baby, it interferes with their ability to uh, sleep and, and can be very very distressing. So in terms of treating postpartum depression there are are several things that you want to consider. Uh, One of the difficult things about treating this patient population is that uh, they are, uh, a lot is demanded of them. They are the primary caretakers typically of a new baby. Um, This is a huge responsibility so in terms of treatment we want something that is effective, that works quickly um, and doesn't produce a lot of side effects. And unfortunately many women seek for seeking post treatment for postpartum depression have um, been ill for quite some time before they come to our attention Uh, and it can be very hard to for them to endure the two to four weeks it takes for an antidepressant to kick in. Uh, In terms of choosing treatment uh, you want to uh, look for medications that work for anxiety symptoms because many women have comorbid anxiety. You also want medications that are effective for helping with their sleep. On the other hand, you don't want medications that are too sedating because uh, these medications can uh, affect a a mom's ability to take care of her baby who will be typically waking up at least several times during the course of the night. But most importantly, you have to consider medications in breastfeeding. All medications taken by the mother are secreted into the breast milk um, and therefore might uh, theoretically impact the nursing infant. Typically we've seen that the concentrations of antidepressants are low, uh, but there, this is something that needs to be considered. We also have to consider whether or not the medication affects milk production. Many women with postpartum depression will not seek treatment until they are finished breastfeeding because they're concerned about the impact of medication on their ability to breastfeed. Um, so ideally you want a medication that allows them to continue to breastfeed but also takes care of the depression. 
we have only one medication that is FDA approved for the treatment of postpartum depression. It is made by Sage Therapeutics and it's on the market as Zolresso. But there are many other treatments that are quite effective for the treatment of postpartum depression and which treatment you choose depends really on the severity of the depression the woman presents with. For women with mild postpartum depression, we typically add additional supports, getting help in the home, recruiting family members. Psychotherapy has also been shown to be effective in this population, both cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal therapy. But other types of psychotherapy probably have a role here in terms of increasing level of supports and identifying uh, important stressors. When we see women with moderate to severe postpartum depression, we consider the use of antidepressants. And these would be the traditional antidepressants that are used to treat other forms of major depression. Uh, typically, we use the SSRIs and SNRIs. We have studies to support the use of uh, fluoxetine, sertraline, paroxetine, and the SNRI venlafax Seen. Women respond well to these medications, um, usually at the standard dosages. Unfortunately, it takes two to four weeks to generate a significant effect with these medications, so that that can be difficult uh, in this patient population uh, who can be really struggling with the depression. Um, Probably the serotonergic agents are more effective than non-serotonergic antidepressants for the treatment of the anxiety and obsessionality that comes along with postpartum depression. There is one study looking at bupropion or Welbutrin which shows that it is effective for the treatment of depression but was not as effective in the patients in that cohort who had uh, more symptoms of anxiety. So typically we reach for the SSRI SSRIs and the SNRIs. And certainly if a woman has had a good response to a particular SSRI in the past, uh, we would reach for that one first. And uh, in terms of breastfeeding, which we talked about earlier, um, most of these medications have been studied in breastfeeding women. Uh, sometimes the medication can be detected in the breast milk, uh, but often at very low levels and uh, in even lower levels in the breastfeeding infant. And the risk of adverse events is very low in this population. So we consider antidepressants, uh, the SSRIs and the SNRIs to be compatible with breastfeeding. Um, many women will come in with questions about hormonal therapy for the treatment of postpartum depression. Uh, the theory being that this is a hormonally related mood disorder and uh, would taking a little extra hormone help. Um, there have been studies which have looked at the effect of estrogen in this population either alone or adding it to an antidepressant and these studies have shown very good results with estrogen. Um, however, in this population there are a lot of risks associated with using additional estrogen. Uh, postpartum women are very hypercoagulable, so adding estrogen can increase their risk of blood clots including uh, DVTs and pulmonary embolism. Estrogen also decreases breast milk production, uh, so these women would not be able to continue to breastfeed in the same way. Many treaters um, use progesterone in this setting. This is popular in Europe, um, but there is very little data to support the use of progesterone in this setting, and there is some data to suggest that it might either trigger postpartum depression or make the symptoms of postpartum depression worse. In 2015, we uh, had the first reports that there might be a new type of treatment for um, postpartum depression. And this was a product put out by Sage Therapeutics. It was called Sage 547. And it was a neurosteroid, which was a derivative of allopregnanolone. And in women, allopregnanolone is produced by the placenta. And 
and uh, it can have effects on the brain. And according to research from animal studies, allopregnanolone binds to the GABA receptor and has an inhibitory effect. It acts like GABA. It's a positive allosteric modulator of the GABA receptor. One of the challenges in using brexanolone is that it has low oral bioavailability. Um, and this means that it can be only administered as an intravenous agent. So uh, women receiving this treatment have uh, received treatment as a 60-hour infusion. So the first study we had was of four women who were treated uh, with brexanolone. These were women with treatment, refractory, postpartum depression. They had failed trials of traditional antidepressant medications, and they received a 60-hour infusion of SAGE 547. And what the researchers found was that really within 24 to 48 hours of starting the infusion, these women started to show a decrease in their depressive symptoms. And by the end of the 60-hour infusion, all of the women had remission of their depression. And the average Hamilton depression rating went from 28 at the beginning of the study to 1.6, uh, which was really a dramatic result. From then, from there on, um, we have the phase two study, which was done at the University of North Carolina with uh, Dr. Samantha Meltzer Brody. And in this study, women received uh, either brexanolone or placebo. Again, it was a 60-hour infusion, a continuous infusion of uh, SAGE 547. These were all women with severe postpartum depression. They had Hamilton uh, depression scores of 26 or above. They had developed depression either during the third trimester of pregnancy or within one month of delivery. Um, and they were no farther than six months postpartum. So in this study, after the 60-hour infusion, uh, seven out of the 10 women had a remission of their depression after treatment with brexanolone compared to only one of the 11 women receiving placebo. So this was a dramatic effect. Um, you could start to see women responding to the medication within four to eight hours uh, of its administration and by 24 hours half of the women had achieved remission. So this was really a dramatic response. When they took this data to the FDA, um, SAGE 547 was granted uh, privileges as a breakthrough therapy with expedited reviews. So they were able to move very quickly onto the phase three studies. So the phase three trials included women with severe postpartum depression and women with moderate depression. The women with moderate depression had Hamilton scores between 20 and 25. And in this study, women again received a continuous 60-hour infusion of brexanolone, um, and it looked as if placebo started to separate from treatment around hour 24, and by hour 60, about 45% of the women had, a, had achieved remission compared to only 23% in the placebo group. They then followed these women for up to 30 days, and those women uh, retained their, the antidepressant effect. They followed the women for 30 days, and those women continued to do well with lower Hamilton scores, and there continued to be a difference between placebo and brexanolone, with brexanolone at the lower dose of 60 micrograms per kilogram doing a little bit better than the higher dose. 
The results looking in women with moderate depression, uh, with moderate postpartum depression, were a little bit less impressive. They had a decrease in Hamilton depression scores, which distinguished them from placebo, but it wasn't as dramatic. And after 30 days, they could no longer distinguish placebo from treatment. In terms of side effects, brexanolone was well tolerated. Uh, the most common side effects were sedation, dizziness, and somnolence. Uh, as well as dry mouth. Uh, these were more common in uh, those receiving treatment versus placebo. Um, there were also a small number of serious adverse events which occurred in less than 4% of the patient population. The most serious adverse events were uh, syncope and presyncope, excessive sedation, and four women had rapid loss of consciousness. Um, so because of these serious side effects, when they went back to the FDA, Zolreso uh, was approved but with a REMS in place. And a REMS is a risk evaluation mitigation strategy. Um, and this means uh, that Zolreso has a black box warning. It means that it also has to be administered in a certified medical setting where there is continuous medical monitoring. Women uh, must be monitored with pulse oximetry during this stay. Um, and I think um, this has some implications in terms of uh, getting these sites up and running. So uh, there are currently about 100 sites which are ready to uh, prescribe Brexanolone, um, uh, but we have uh, still some more obstacles in terms of administering this medication. Um, the first is that many women uh, who have new children don't want to be hospitalized for three days. Um, in the current state of what we know, women cannot breastfeed while they're taking Brexanolone alone because we have no data on its safety in breastfeeding. Another issue is the cost of Brexanolone. Um, the medication alone is $34,000 and we don't have a great sense of how insurance will cover the medication. Um, another concern about Brexanolone is that it is uh, labeled as a Schedule IV medication uh, because it has a similar uh, mechanism of action to midazolam and diazepam. I think the uh, uh, likelihood of abuse or diversion is low given that this is a medication with very restricted provisions for its delivery. However, some women with substance abuse histories uh, may be concerned about this treatment. So in terms of the ideal candidate for Brexanolone, she would be a woman with severe postpartum depression. Um, who uh, has had her onset of depression either in the third trimester of pregnancy or within the first month after delivery. Um, according to the FDA approval, she cannot be beyond six months postpartum. Um, what we don't know still is how Brexanolone would work for women with bipolar depression, which can be very severe, nor do we know how um, it would work with patients who are acutely suicidal, because those patients were excluded from the original studies. The other big question with Brexanolone is how long does its effects last? Um, we only have data up until 30 days after the infusion, and it is possible that Brexanolone could cure postpartum depression, um, but it might work like other antidepressants where after the infusion, women might be vulnerable to having a relapse. So we still don't have that data, and um, we are looking forward to further research in the field. Um, the other thing to keep track of is that there is another product that Sage Therapeutics is working on called Sage 217 or Zuranolone. It acts much like Brexanolone, but it is available in an oral form. And that medication is now enter entering phase three trials. And that's it for this week's episode of the MDEdge Sitecast. For MDEdge, I'm Gina Henderson.